Anyway, we'll get going. So uh, my name is Joe Grand. I'm Zaz Brooks. And uh, we are back for yet another um, fun, entertaining session about Prototype This. So, oh, I guess we should ask. Who has seen Prototype This, which was a TV show on Discovery Channel? Okay, so that's more than last time, I think. Yeah, and it's totally awesome that people who haven't seen it have still come to this talk. So yeah, why hopefully you come to this talk? you'll be excited. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, yeah, anyway, um, uh, Prototype This was a uh, short-lived TV show on Discovery Channel. Um, 13 episodes filmed over like 18 months. Yeah, it was from, from start of pilot to end of shooting, it was almost exactly two years. And uh, it's, yeah, so we filmed it in 2008, and it aired uh, for a little while in the U.S., and then started airing all over the place, uh, and then kind of disappeared for a while. Now it's revived itself on Netflix and Pirate Bay, which is awesome. Um, so definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. And uh, it basically was, was uh, four guys building crazy prototypes of stuff, and we're going to talk about some of those crazy prototypes. Yeah, and with not very much money or time. The, there was sort of like this artificial time limit that the network you know, made us do to sort of make it seem more exciting, uh, even though often we took more than that time. And there was, they, forgot, they kind of forgot to budget for engineering supplies. And, and this, that's, that's serious. And so they managed to cobble together from the budget $12,000 per episode for all engineering supplies, consulting, everything. Yeah, which is not a lot when you realize that the show is about engineering. And uh, yeah, so if you want to know a lot of the down and dirty secrets of the show, see our DEF CON 17 talk. And uh, same production company as Mythbusters. Somebody, somebody the, the other day was like, hey, you guys should talk to the, the, those guys that make Mythbusters because they made an awesome show so they could do another one. And I'm like, actually we did. <laughs> and uh, our show was awesome, it was just one season. So oh yeah, anyway, okay, so the original fan site is still up on the Discovery Channel um, website, and then all of the engineering documentation that I could gather for the technical portions of the build, the electronics portions that I had handled, and then the software stuff that Zaz has done, um, is up on my website. So if you want to like build upon it, or use it, or see how we did it, or just grab the code, or whatever you can. So here's the talent. That's what they called us, talent, which is kind of cool. Um, let's yeah, see. we didn't get a dressing room though. No, we did not. We asked for one here though, but they, they didn't give us one. Um, anyway, so I was the electronics guy, as I said. Saws. Um, yeah, I mostly took care of anything that needed to be coded for the show and also late night machining. Yeah. And uh, Mike North was our man of many talents. He didn't really have a defined role, he sort of just did all the stuff that nobody else wanted to do. Um, and then Terry was our machinist and special effects guy from LA. So it was kind of a good mix of you know, uh, skills across the board. And uh, the show originally started, the, the production crew was like, let's just put some cameras in a room and, uh, okay, go build something. And they didn't realize there was a whole process behind the engineering and design and testing and failing and fixing it and all of that. So it was I, a, I a challenge. I should not, on the pilot, <laughs> they literally put us all in the room with cameras to design this robot and they said, all right guys, start designing the robot. And then they got bored after like 30 seconds as we started actually doing <laughs> yeah. real design. They're like, all right, just like throw some things in a pile and say that's how, you know, how, you, you know, how you're going to do it and then we'll let you, leave you alone to do the real design meeting in a few hours. Yeah. And then what made us feel great is we had a separate room. So the machine shop was in one place. Um, we filmed the pilot in a place called Tech Shop in, uh, in San Mateo? Uh, Menlo Park. Menlo the Park, original yeah. Tech Shop. The original Tech Shop. So it was, you know, there's machines and lots of, lots of stuff to work on. So the machine shop was in one area. We had a room that we had called the lair, which was our electronics area and you know, all the machines set up and stuff for soldering and, and coding. And uh, we were in there building some stuff for, for the pilot and the camera guy, who I guess was like a famous camera guy and filmed National Geographic, like amazing you know, whales and oceans and stuff. And uh, he was filming us soldering and he's like, okay, this is boring, I'm going. And then he went into the machine shop and just hung out and smoked cigarettes or something, <laughs> or did coke. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the first few people we had on our show were, it was really bad. There, there, was, some, there was some production problems early on. <laughs> yeah, but these people that are up on here um, were not doing coke as far as I know. Um, and uh, it was very helpful. So, you know, the four of us were on screen, but we had so many people behind the scenes helping us. And that's always this myth with, with television is like, oh, you guys have your own show. You can do whatever you want. You can, you know, whatever. But there's so many people that were helping us along the way. Um, so, you know, PAs and production staff and various producers and stuff. And uh, 
We, w- we definitely wouldn't have been able to do the show or the builds without them. Especially Joe Andreas, uh, middle center, who's a special effects guy from down in LA. Um, you know, and he's just a total maniac, can build, it, build anything, and he was uh, spending a lot of late nights uh, on some of the later builds. Once it became clear that the show was so difficult to make, um, with it, he got brought in for a lot of episodes, and you'll uh, see some of the stuff that he did um, you know, when we get to the builds, which we should get to. Yes, we probably should, outside. yeah. Okay, so who is here for our DEF CON 17 talk? Okay, a few. Cool. cool. And who's here at DEF CON for the first time? Oh, geez. Nice. I hope cool. you're having a blast. It's like half the people here. Um, okay, so last time we talked about, I can't see the slides sort of, but <laughs> traffic busting trucks. That was the upper right. It was a big giant truck that elevated itself and drove over tra- traffic and had some autonomous modes and, and crazy things like that. Uh, fire fighting pyro pack. So this was a, uh, a high tech pyro pack for firefighters that had a heads up display and a thermal imaging camera and some sensors for firefighter identification and an awesome superhero dry chem thing that Zaz had made, like you pull your, this thing on your arm and chemicals come out, right? Yeah, watch, w- watch the show. Let's get to the next slide. Let's talk right. about what we're actually right. talking about. Sea Adventure water slide, flying lifeguard. Here's what we're talking about. Go so, for it. Yeah, so today we thought we'd cover our other five favorite projects from the 13, uh, boxing robots, what Discovery called mind control car, six-legged ATV, uh, the get up and go, sleep pod, and autom- autonomous pizza delivery. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, so Boxing Robots, this was our first official build. Um, we had filmed the pilot, and uh, n- none of us knew each other. And a few weeks later, we started building these giant 10-foot boxing robots that would move based on the movement of players outside the ring. And we made this whole spectacle around it. Yeah, basically, this, was, this one was Terry's idea. We'd gone through the pilot, and originally, they wanted us to build two different, completely different things per episode. So it was even harder to begin with. And so once we got through the pilot and everyone was kind of fried already, Terry was just like, let's do giant boxing robots because you know, we, we, all, we all know how to do it. You know, Terry's done all this kind of special effects stuff. He basically had the whole thing in mind mechanically already. And we knew that we could figure out the electronics and the code pretty easily for it. And this one, I think, was actually a two-week build. Yeah, this, yeah. Was, this was one of the few that we got done on time. Um, and uh, let's see, so yeah, this... Oh, you can talk about the mechanical stuff. I don't really know what it is. <laughs> I don't understand it. Well, basically, um, every, everything was super simple mechanically. It was just um, sort of universal joints uh, welded together with uh, pneumatic cylinders to move everything around. And then the outside, you know, this is one of the, th- the things that Mike contributed. He's like, you know, we really need to make these robots look awesome. Um, but we don't have time to, you know, even really think about the exterior design that much while we're building the inside. So I know this guy, he was, he's really tied into the San Francisco art scene, Burning Man and everything. He's like, I know this guy who builds robot sculptures out of found stuff from junkyards. So let's just get him to select some stuff to put on the outside. And Nemo came in and just made these like totally awesome looking uh, you know, badass robots out of bits of cars. And uh, you know, the, the heads are made out of um, gas tanks. Uh, yeah, they're, they're the uh, outboard motor t- tanks for, uh, for a boat. And so it ended up looking really cool. Yeah, those look cool. And it was, the, the robots were pneumatically controlled. So that was just this Pro XR serial RS-232 interface. So Terry kind of handled that build of the robot side, and then Zaz and I handled the, the detection and control of them. And Mike actually built the second robot, but they didn't film it because they wanted to make, like, make everyone like, sort of pigeonholed. And so he just got totally ripped off and no yeah. one knew. But he built the second robot. Poor Mike. <laughs> um, OK, so the, let's see. Um, from the hardware side, we needed a way to detect the punches that a player was throwing. So we decided to have two, it was the jab and the uppercut. Mm-hmm. And we used a Freescale Z-Star module, which was this three-axis accelerometer reference design. Um, they don't make that version anymore, but they have some other one. If you want to mess around with them, there's a cool software interface that we could see the actual results, and it was graphed. And that's how we figured out. We would throw our jabs and uppercuts and figure out how uh, we were going to detect those. And uh, so the, uh, I can't see what we've got here. This oh, yeah. So I had, to, I, had to do, I had to do it in, uh, in Windows uh, because of the cameras we were using. I wanted to get some um, nice high-res Firewire cameras, but the budget didn't support it. So I ended up getting these nice IDS micro eyes. They're USB 2, um, sort of like a webcam package, but it's an industrial sensing camera. Um, and they were, they were pretty nice um, for detecting. And then I just used an AR toolkit build to do the motion tracking. So that was like super simple, um, you know, basically out of the box. You get the six degree of freedom information from the glyph. Um, and then for the punch detection, 
a pretty simple shape filter on the three different axes. Uh, it turns out that if you throw a jab versus this uppercut thing, like, um, you get a pretty nice repeatable signal from that every time you do it. So um, it was just like a, a little filter on that. Um, what else there? Yeah, and then what, what, that, what they, those uh, classifiers did was send out like, uh, you know, punch packets basically to the um, uh, pneumatic controller. So I would assemble a queue, feed those out via UDP, and uh, that, that becomes important later. <laughs> oh, wait, I'll, I'll say yeah. it now, that slide. So uh, people asked afterwards, what, during, the, during the final battle, they were like, how come your can't hands were on the keyboard the whole time? You were just cheating for Joe, right? <laughs> and the reason they were is because, you know, any, like anything, when you just coded pretty much the day before, there's still some issues and we hadn't really done a lot of testing. So I was able to fill up the motion queue of the robot so they had a few punches left to go and then I could quickly kill the program and recompile and br bring it back to uh, the status that it was on. So I had like a few hidden keys to um, bring the score meters and everything back to the, where they were when I had to kill the program during the, it, during the fight. It's the magic of television. And I think this was actually the first like television usage of AR toolkit, right? Of augmented reality? It seemed to be really new. I'd seen it at a conference uh, a little while before that and everyone, you know, a lot of the people that I knew were using it. But uh, when I told the TV guys about it, it completely blew their mind. And they yeah. couldn't understand the way that this, you know, the, this glyph you, translated to something moving on a screen. And I had to eventually build this little ball maze, which I control with a glyph. And then the TV guy's like, oh, right, OK, finally we get it. All right, cool. And we'll, then they we'll ended up that. breaking it by accident, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so besides the, the control of the, the robots, which mostly was software-based, um, we also had a, uh, what we called the healthometer, which was a scoring system, because we actually had a whole setup boxing match. Oh yeah, I should mention too, so the boxing match was um, supposed to be like nerd versus awesome boxer. And uh, since this was the first episode, they're still trying to pigeonhole us. And uh, we, we trained at a, well trained, we went to a gym, an actual real boxing gym um, in San Francisco and got to fight a Golden Gloves national champion or something that, you know, she was about this tall, a female, very scrappy. And, uh, well, you'll watch the episode, you'll yeah. see. But it basically, but, you know, it was all like, let's, let's see the nerds get beaten up by a girl and that's yeah. it. everyone's going to think that's funny. It was awesome. Which was kind of funny. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But so we needed a scoring system. So um, the healthometer was sort of an independent thing that uh, we had... Um, uh, magnets and Hall effect sensors in the robot's neck. So as the robot got punched, and the neck would, the head would go back. We would detect that as a as a hit, and then reduce the score. That was a, a basic stamp two, and um, all of the lights were just 120 volt, you know, colored floodlights. So we had this. Uh, we had a bunch of SSRs with an EFF EFX Tech RC4 controller, which can control four solid state relays um, over serial. So we had a bunch of those. You could just send commands from the basic stamp when you detect. A, uh, a hit, then we could change the score. And I should mention too that people are probably wondering why basic stamp, how come not Arduino? This was in 2008 when Arduino was not even, you know, sort of coming up. So, you know, you could do these same sort of things with Arduino if that's your, your platform of choice and you can check out the code and sort of port stuff over. Oh yeah, here's a video of it. Is it going? No. So they're punching and stuff. It's a, uh, it was more exciting in person. <laughs> at, at first, you know, because we'd made all these like nice, you know, painted gloves and the legs and everything like that, and we didn't want to destroy them immediately. So at first, we had to turn the pressure down on all the pneumatic cylinders, so it just kind of worked. Um, and then in the final battle, we turned it up to maximum, and bits were flying off everywhere. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing too is don't let an animatronics guy um, script up custom things to do with two robots up on stage. <laughs> I have videos of those, but I know there's some kids here that are under 18, so I'm not going to show it. But it looks strikingly real for two robots, you know, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Um, so this was the one that the network decided to call Mind Control Car, and what we called it, this drove me freaking crazy, so this is a rant. Uh, we called it anger management, and the idea was that if you get road rage, then a therapy session would be to have to participate in a demolition derby where the angrier you got, the worse your car would perform, right? So you'd have to learn to stay in control while you were trying to smash other people's cars. And then the network, you know, just either didn't get it or didn't, you know, they were trying to push everything as being this future product. And so they said, oh, you know, when you watch the episode, it says, you know, in the future, when you get angry, your car would pull off the road and stop. Because that won't make you more yeah, angry. Everyone who watches yeah. the show is like, 
Dude, that's so stupid. You guys are idiots. Like, who would want a car like that? We're not fucking stupid. Yeah. It was never about that. And they showed it over and over again, that cartoon. So actually, this, this episode was an exercise for us in anger management, too. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole story. We'll just say that both of us almost quit every day. And you almost got kicked off the show, right? Uh, yeah. For your hair? I don't know if it was your hair or if it was something else with that other person they tried yeah. to add on the show. Yeah, it was a, this, this was like a miserable, miserable experience. Um, it turned out okay, though. So this was four cars, um, remote controlled, that would crash into each other and you had to stay calm. And it also took GSR and, and EKG as f part of other things to, to monitor in your body. Yeah, we're doing all this whole like, kind of uh, biometric thing um, with the, uh, you know, the measurements of uh, heart rate and galvanic skin response uh, to see if people were stressed. Uh, but of course, the big deal, which we'll get to in a sec, was the, was the sort of mind control headsets. Yeah. Um, just wanted to quickly s say something about um, instrumenting or like automating a car and making it remote controlled. Um, we wanted to ask the guys from Mythbusters about it because they've done it a million times and they would just tell us what to do and save us a lot of time. And the production company would be like, no, you cannot talk to those guys. Uh, we want to keep you completely separate because we don't want it to look like um, you're a Mythbusters ripoff show, even though we're basically trying to do, uh, you know, have the same success we have with Mythbusters. So we got Joe Andreas in um, and uh, he figured out how to do it all. And it basically is really simple. I talked to my brother as well because um, he had some guys who had done um, robotic cars. And if you want to make a robot drive a real car, there are some, there are some serious issues with it like, uh, that you have to deal with, like stiction in the pedals and things like that. And there's like a lot of complex control stuff. But if it's just a human driving it, they just figure all that stuff out. So it's just super easy. You can just see it's like you know, almost totally ghetto. There's like a, a motor with a cam on it that's pushing the pedals. The steering wheel is just connected to a belt drive. These are total beaters from the junkyard, right? So it's not like doing a Prius where there's already motors in the power steering and stuff. And then there's not a photo of it, but in order to shift into gear, there's just a big fat linear actuator on the gear shift and it just... <laughs> and so yeah, we had to do this for four cars and it was all... Um, originally, this was since Joe Andreas does a lot of special effects stuff, it was all just RC um, transmitters which we had to, Zaz had to actually get hooked up to his PC, which I'm sure he's going <laughs> to enjoy talking about. <laughs> um, okay, so from the electronic side, we wanted to have uh, like a pod. Each person would have a pod that they would sit in and they'd be hooked up to all the stuff and they'd have a screen and they'd be able to see what their car is seeing. But then they'd also have this heads up, or the, uh, this on-screen display of like their current heart rate and their, their uh, 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 I don't know what else is up there. Oh yeah, what gear the car is in, the acceleration and all of that stuff. So, you know, they had to calm themselves down. And we were actually worried that, you know, because it was the four of us driving and we knew the system, that we wouldn't get angry enough and it would just be kind of a bust and the cars would just always just work. So we, we also designed in that uh, Joe figured out how to do an electric shock machine that would the like, shock we, we had to send shocks yeah. to each other while we were trying to drive, but we didn't end up using it. Yeah, we used it, just not on the show. <laughs> we used it on Mike Noah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, we did find a we did find some way to cheat on this game, didn't we? Did didn't I win? <laughs> yeah, no. I, I think I, I don't remember. I think you did, but I think it was because everyone else's car died. Oh no! It was if you took off the the emotive headset, which we're going to talk about for the mind control part, or something like that. You could sort of cheat it to still move around, like it wouldn't stop you. Yeah. I don't exactly. Remember. The mind control was only to get the car started, uh, and then you could also shut it down. But yeah, if you if you move the electrodes, I remember yeah. now, so that they didn't get a good reading, it would just kind of freeze out and then the car would keep working forever. So the way this worked is I had a PS2, PlayStation 2 driving controller that was just you know regular PS2 connector, um, hooked that up to a basic stamp because the, the PlayStation 2 controllers are all serial um, so I could monitor that and, and pass those commands um, off to Zaz over network so I was using Lantronics export which are serial to, to Ethernet adapters. They were basically um, the coolest individual component of the whole experience. Like, yeah. uh, well, we used those a lot. On being the, able to the not show. deal with serial anymore and just do everything over the network was just so nice. Yeah, it was nice. Um, and then the, the Bob 4H on-screen on display, which was also a serial type of device. You send commands to it and feed video in and get video out, which was kind of cool. Um, so the big deal, though, for everyone at the network was these new, at the time, uh, you know, mind-reading EEG-based headsets. Um, and so we talked to the two companies that were, uh, at the time, working on the prototypes. One was this company Emotive, and it's a single electrode uh, device that um, you, you've probably seen it now in a lot of products like the Star Wars Force Trainer. 
And if, you want, if anyone wants to do any hacking of um, brain machine interface stuff, this, this thing is super, super easy to do. This, everything, all of the EEG based classification takes place on a custom ASIC and then it gets fed out over one of the lines on RS-232 at like 9600 boards. So you can just tap in and you can get everything from that chip. Um, so just take apart a force trainer and you can use it to control all kinds of things. You get, um, I can't remember, you get two, two uh, 8-bit values out of it. Um, the one is, um, we get three. One is like how well the headset is making a connection and then you get two useful ones that, but you don't really know what they are. It's, it's like whatever I set up there which I forgot what it was. Um, attention and uh, meditation. And so nothing, didn't, you know, we weren't really sure what either of those things were and whether they really related to road rage. And anyway, at the time, we think they only had a couple of headsets and they couldn't give us four of them. Yeah. So Emotive had this one that was also new that was a video game controller um, that had you know, 10 electrodes and did, in addition to these kind of like um, calmness uh, measures, um, it would read the electrical signals from the facial musculature and give you facial expressions. And then also it had this kind of classifier, which they wouldn't tell you how it worked, but you trained it. Um, it was probably some kind of support vector machine. So you would think about something while in training mode. And then if you thought about that thing again, it would recognize it. And supposedly you could train it with like 10 different things, but no one, even at Emotive, said that anyone at that point had been able to train it with more than like two or three. So we just decided we'd go with that one and we would use you know, the mind control thing because it was sexy and new and think about something to start the car. And, and to show that off, we did the good old spoon bending test. Yes. Um, and also this, uh, uh, the Emotive, I think it's the Emotive or there is another um, brain machine interface thing for toys. I think it's a Mattel mind something game where you control a ball. And yeah, people are starting to hack on that now. What's it called? Oh, it's NeuroSky. Okay, so the yeah. NeuroSky one. Okay. Yeah, so that's in a lot of different products now. If you pull them apart, you can see that little chip. Yeah. All right, so here's the spoon bending test. Um, actually, I'm going to have to hold my mic up to the speaker, I think. Uh, well, we can. Here's how this test is going to work. No. Oh, lame. Okay. Well, never mind. Anyway, just, we just, you know, we, a lot of our sort of attention came to um, how to demonstrate technical stuff so that the TV guys could understand it and so that then people watching the show also uh, would think it was fun and cool um, if they didn't already know about it. And so, you know, Joe and I ended up spending quite a lot of our non-design time thinking about ways that we could um, get technical stuff on TV. You know, it was a really, a really a fight with the production company. So once we're like, well, mind control, you know, what does everyone want to do? There's that Yuri Geller guy, you know, bending spoons. Let's bend the spoon. Um, and then similarly, um, this one I was really proud of. Like out of, out of everything that we did uh, for Prototype This, uh, one of the sequences that I'm pro the most proud of is I managed to convince the network to let me talk about multi-threaded coding on national TV, right? <laughs> so um, we filmed this little, what Joe and I called them was like podcast style segments. And you know, once they, once they had basically come clean to us and said, look, we're not going to talk about the nitty gritty details of the stuff you guys do because we think it's really boring and we don't understand it. So. We would you know, come up with these, uh, they said, okay, you can have one minute per episode to do a podcast style technical introduction to whatever it is that, you're, that you guys do. And I, I, you know, just, to, just to illustrate that this was so serious, in the Mind Control Car episode, you know, Joe had designed this whole circuit board to uh, you know, control the pods and everything like that and they didn't show it in the episode at all. You know, the most important thing that Joe had done and the reason was the network execs didn't know what a circuit board was. <laughs> and afterwards, when we were really upset about it, you know, Joe was like, what the hell, man? You just cut all my stuff out. Yeah, every single episode has a circuit board and they don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then someone, I think John Tessier, explained to the network guy that a circuit board was the, th the green thing inside of VCR <laughs> that made it work. And then they're like, oh, oh, right, okay. We yeah. gotta show that. We'll, yeah. we'll show that. <laughs> yeah, so. So we actually have one, on one episode, we go to watch circuit boards, you know, getting fabricated for one of our builds, which was awesome. But yeah, so getting, making technical things look fun and sexy is really hard. You know, if you're in this room, you probably would just, you know, we don't need to make it fun and sexy because you already think it's fun and sexy, but like for my family, had to make <laughs> it fun and sexy. So, okay, I think we have audio now. So let's try this one. This was the, uh, the, uh, the multi-threaded Yeah, when I, when, I, when I scripted this podcast style thing, I was like, we're going to do a four-way split screen and Joe is going to be each of the threads. And, you know, the TV, uh, the producer was like, that's total chaos, man. Like, it's going to take us all day to film this. You know, come up with something else. And I'm like, no, 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 this is going to be really cool. Trust me. And uh, so I'm really proud of it. So I wanted to show it. Yeah. All right. Here we go. An inside look at computer coding. Right now, Saz is coding. It might look like he's just playing around on the keyboard. 
He's actually writing specialized programs that are going to tie all of these different parts of the build together. It's pretty complicated stuff. So for a little better explanation, some more detail about how everything really works, I present to you the Codemaster. There's a lot of custom code that has to be written to get this anger management system to work. That's why you see me typing all the time. Code is a written set of instructions that tells a computer what to do, and I'm the one that has to write it. My code is made up of threads. A thread is like a little program that runs inside a larger one. There can be a bunch of threads, like Joe here, Hi. but they all run independently to perform a specific task. In this system, each car is controlled by four threads. A game controller thread, which takes data from the steering wheel and pedals. A biopack thread, which reads the driver's heart rate and perspiration level to regulate the car's performance. An emotive or mind control thread, which controls the car's transmission. And a car controller thread. So let's say the driver puts the pedal to the metal. A signal gets sent to the game controller thread, telling it to hit the gas. At the same time, the biopack thread is also getting data from the driver's body, measuring heart rate and perspiration or galvanic skin response. At the same time as this, the emotive thread processes events from the emotive system and decides whether or not the car should be put into forward gear. Finally, the car controller thread looks at everything the other threads have produced and decides what to do with the car. If the driver's brain waves are calm and focused, and their heart rate is good, and their perspiration level shows they're cool and collected, the car controller thread puts the car in gear and hits the gas. But if the biopack and emotive threads show agitation, then the car controller thread will slow things down because the driver's getting too stressed. This is all just for one car. For four cars all working together, that's going to be a lot of threads. And if I can't get all those threads to work together, we're going to be dead in the water. So I had to re-record that voiceover uh, about 12 times because you know, they wanted to tweak things like, we don't know what the emotive thread is, you have to say emotive or mind control thread. And also they, of course, made me say that thing at the end, like, yeah, if I can't get it to work, you know, everything's going to be screwed up. Oh, doom. I designed it, of course I'm going to get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they have, to, they have to add the drama. And uh, so I don't have a picture of the actual demolition derby because you can go watch it on your own, but this is like a behind the scenes of us testing it. And I think, yeah, our producer is driving it. John Tessier is our producer. And there's nothing more scary than seeing a car drive without a person in it. Like, you know it's gonna be cool, but when you're sitting in front of the car and it's driving on its own, it's terrifying. So here's a, here's a demo of that. Yeah, so that one was actually pretty cool. Ah, the six-legged all-terrain vehicle, the bane of our existence. <laughs> yeah, this, so this one for, well, I don't know if I should spoil it, but anyway, it was a, it was a, it was a hard project that may or may not have worked in the end. <laughs> yeah. um, so basically, the idea was, you know, we wanted to uh, build some kind of crazy contraption that a person would ride in, and we thought about, you know, a legged vehicle. So, um, you know, Building like vehicles is tough, right? Some of the smartest guys uh, that have ever worked on robots are working for companies like Boston Dynamics to make leg vehicles, and so we're not going to get it done in two weeks unless we start with some kind of small robot platform and just scale it up. So that's what we decided to do right off the bat, and then it was just a question of which one. We looked at a few that we thought would be fun and cool, and the one that we chose was this one called Rex, R-H-E-X. And it um, has the distinction, I think, for being, in terms of uh, body lengths per unit time, the fastest legged robot out there. So we thought that would be cool if we can scale it up, we'll have the fastest legged vehicle out there. <laughs> yes, so uh, we should make sure we have a crash cage so that uh, the, the driver might survive. Um, and so we uh, got this guy, uh, the Rex project was actually at several uh, universities um, and uh, the licensing for the Rex, like a lot of the Rex patents, uh, was licensed by a guy called uh, Halden Komsuoglu and he started a company, uh, Sandbox Innovations. And he came on the show to help us out and write all the, uh, tune all the controllers. 
Um, the interesting thing about the platform, um, it's got uh, six legs and they alternate in tripods. So three of the legs come forward and take, take the weight of the robot while the other three flip around. One degree of freedom per leg. So these legs are just flipping around. And that's actually, it's, it's a biomimetic thing. So it's based on what was like a cockroach or some bug. We have, remember we had to go yeah, visit some it's, disgusting It's one. inspired, the, the alternating tripod gate, if you look at uh, hexapod creatures, they all do it. Um, Roaches actually do some interesting stuff with their back legs when they move really fast, but mo mostly they walk by three on the ground to maintain stability. And the, just the interesting thing about this one is, you know, when the three legs come in and take the robot's weight and the other three whip around, the materials properties of the legs are super important. If the, um, if the legs are too stiff, then the robot just stays in place. It, it depends on that springiness of the, of the legs compressing to take the weight and then bouncing the robot forward to give it its speed. So that, that's why designing the legs uh, off the bat, we thought that was going to be the toughest problem, and we really concentrated a lot of a lot of energy in the form of Mike North on those legs. Yeah, and also scaling something up isn't always just as easy as scaling something up, and yeah. and the legs were were part of that problem. Um, what you want to talk about this mechanical thing, legs? Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, I'll just say one thing. Uh, we went we went out at this point in the show. We were uh, able to get outside consultants to help us out, and we went to Spec Design uh, to do the design of the chassis. And the guy uh, from Spec, their, their, their lead mechanical engineer, super, super nice guy, and he was really, really concerned about the safety of this thing. I mean, you see that video and you know that basically no good can come of this. So um, he was very resistant to using aluminum tube for safety reasons. He just wanted to make it this thing just built like a tank. So we ended up going with chromoly steel, which caused big problems later on because um, it was so, so heavy. I think you could do this safely out of aluminum if you just like you did a bunch of FEA on it and you just figured out you know, it's crash scenarios and just making sure that structure wasn't going to break. But there wasn't time for that. But uh, prop, props to um, John from Spec for caring about our survival. Yeah, and we didn't build that chassis at all. We had some other guys build it outside who specialized in making chassis. Um, and then the legs, uh, Mike North helped design them, but they were made by a, by a, a place that specializes in um, composite, making things that, you know, out of, out of uh, um, carbon fiber materials. So this build, we definitely would have been able to do yeah. by ourselves, no way. And they, they gave us a whole fridge full of like uh, carbon fiber composite and, and so on, because the, the, the cement you have to store in a fridge, and they just delivered it. So those legs probably would have cost tens, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, it's like a, yeah. it's a lot of carbon fiber. Well, that's the benefit of being on TV. You just call someone up and say, hey, we're doing a TV show, can you give us some free stuff? And they'll be like, sure, until they find out, you know, what it is that they're doing. And, uh, but yeah, they committed a lot of money to it and a lot of resources. It was awesome. So Mike got these legs back and he wanted to demonstrate how springy they were because the springiness was the important part of, of this project. So he built this whole contraption to, to ride a, a horse. I guess he's from Wyoming, so he, this was like a natural thing for him. So that's our uh, omnidirectional forklift. Uh, I'm driving the forklift and I'm just jacking it up and down to put some oscillation yeah. on that leg. And uh, let's take a look at what happens. Yeah, the, check this out. The leg is very strong and, uh, and pretty much unbreakable, as you'll see. I'm not sure that made it to air. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that gave a lot of the TV people the brown trousers because they didn't have a lot of liability insurance for this kind of stuff. So that, that footage, if, if Joe didn't save that, then that would never see, have seen the light of yeah. day. I think that stuff actually disappeared from the, from the reels, you know, from, from their tapes. So Zaz and I had our ways of getting some of this important footage to preserve history. Um, oh, the drivetrain. Okay, so um, just, just a little bit about this. When you scale something up, especially when you only have two weeks to do it in, the big decision really is like how far out of your comfort zone do you want to get? And we were decide, tr trying to decide whether we should go, you know, the little Rex uses brushed DC motors with planetary gearheads, you know, just like these uh, Maxon, you know, ni nice ones, but things that we're all really familiar with. Um, the Boston Dynamics, like Big Dog and stuff like that, has a hydraulic drive system. Um, and then we could, you know, could have gone somewhere in between, like some of the, if you look at amusement park rides, they have these giant, like, th uh, three-phase three electric motors and stuff on them. So, you know, we're just trying to toss up, you know, should we go hydraulic? We've never done anything really with hydraulics before. Uh, should we, you know, go to these other um, systems that we don't know a lot about? Or should we just try and scale it up, you know? And we just said, all right, let's just, you know, we, we think we can do it. We've done all the, like, uh, torque requirement calculations and stuff. We think we can do it just with brushed DC motors and planetary gearboxes. In retrospect, that was a mistake. Uh, we should, yes. uh, if we were building this again today, uh, we would go hydraulic uh, because that would just solve a lot of problems. You could just you know, throw a ton of, of pressure at the problem. But 
But what we decided to do was get these, you know, sort of go the BattleBot style route with it, get these custom wound mag motors um, that are really, really high performance, um, just a huge fat industrial planetary gearbox on it with a 40 to 1 reduction. And, um, you know, we think, we think it'll work out. Um, the motor control, things started to not work out pretty soon. Uh, the <laughs> motor controllers we had, even though they said they were rated for the currents that we were putting through this, uh, it started to explode pretty quickly. And they had all these safety features in them so that they would just turn, the, turn them off. So the machine would try and stand up, all the safety things would kick in and the thing would collapse. So we disabled the safety features, exploded the motor controllers. We went out there to find the, the, the beefiest DC motor controllers we could find. And what we got were these Sevcon millipacks. They're for electric vehicles. Um, we, so we put a whole uh, bunch of those, one per, one per leg. Um, then we started to discover, you know, we, we know that we can do this, but we still, this machine still won't stand up. Like, you know, you know what's the problem here? And, and um, we figured out when we talked to this guy, Peef, that when you run 1,000 amps at 48 volts, right, 48 kilowatts yeah. through a wire around the outside of a chassis, <laughs> even though it's a single loop, inductive effects start to come into play. It was and scary you, shit. Yeah, and you can't get those rise times that you need if you want to just turn it on. So, um, you know, we had to strip down, like rewire everything, just get any, the slightest loop out of it to, to get rid of those inductive effects. Yeah, yeah there's so. a lot of noise, and, and we made it, we made an optical, uh, an, uh, essentially like an optical communication system. So it was taking in the motor control signals and then sending it over fiber optics to the receiver so we could get rid of all the noise that was, that was being caused around the system. Yeah, these giant 48 kilowatt EM pulses were fritzing everything yeah. out. Uh, so if you, when, when you build EVs in the future, if, they're gonna, if you're going to do that, um, go, go high voltage and keep those currents down because they're a problem. Yeah. Oh, here's but a let's skip the, the leg attack 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 attack. Okay, we'll skip the podcast. Um, so the control side, uh, we needed a way to drive this thing. And um, the original version that Halden had worked on was a, I think he was controlling it just from his Linux box. Um, but we wanted a real joystick so you could sit inside the chassis and, uh, you know, control it. We had a bunch of buttons that would stand up the, the thing and, well, we tried to stand up the thing, have it sit, and change the different modes. So it was sort of an arcade style thing where you would sit inside the chassis. Um, so I had a, a PC, um, no, no, this was an arcade-style uh, joystick, just a big, huge arcade-style joystick with a, cus a modified board that I had written, that I had uh, worked on. So I had a project called the Stell Adapter, which was this Atari 2600 to USB um, interface uh, that you could, you know, use paddle controllers and joysticks and stuff. So I modified that to be the big joystick to USB interface and then plugged that into to Halden's control uh, box, which was some Linux machine. And then we had a trigger that just served as a, as a dead man switch. So it was actually kind of cool, and it, it worked out pretty well. Um, the batteries we used? They, they were exciting. Uh, an, another chance to use something that at the time was new. So these were uh, these giant lithium iron phosphate batteries from China. So that was a pretty much brand new chemistry at the time that everyone was excited about. Um, the uh, thing was, they were so new that they didn't come with a battery management system. So, you know, we're halfway through this project and suddenly, hey, Joe, you got another thing to design. Design a battery management system for these brand new batteries that you can charge with an inrush current of, what, 72 amps? Yeah, they, yeah, they, they could charge at a very high, very high current. But yeah, I think we got the batteries first and then they're like, well, how are we going to charge them? And they're like, Joe, hello. So we had to design this thing. We, we had one, one day, we had one day to design this. So this was, this was a time where we reached out to some of our contacts and and begged to have our boards fabbed right away. And uh, we actually got, we got the boards fabbed and got them back the next day, uh, which was ridiculous. So, I had, so for each individual battery cell, which was this lithium iron phosphate, it had similar properties to like lithium ion. So I could use a, a Maxim, off the shelf Maxim um, li uh, lithium ion charger and just jack that up to the max that I could. So it was a four amp charging rate, which is slow. Like that's good for like a, a cell phone or some portable device, but not gigantic batteries that had, I think it was like a hundred, uh, yeah, 90 amp hour batteries. Um, so it took 15 hours for full charge, which means that production actually had to plan ahead uh, for our builds, otherwise we'd run out of battery power. Uh, but it was cool, so it had a, ch a charging circuit and also a discharge, because you don't want to run um, lithium ion types of chemistries below 3 point, or below 2.7 volts or something like that, 3.0 volts. So I built a little discharge circuit and the LED would be green uh, when you were above uh, the right threshold and it would turn red when it wasn't. So we could easily just look at the system and see. So it was sort of a totally hacked together budget battery management system. And normally they cost what, like thousands of dollars for electric vehicles or something. And yeah, we, we cranked it out. Aha, uh -huh. this is your favorite, I think. <laughs> yeah, so this was, a, this was a fun episode for me because I got to be the test guinea pig and uh, all kinds of, um, you know, just a terrible just terrible indignities were wreaked upon me in the show. But the idea was, you know, you see those old cartoons, like the Warner Brothers cartoons, you know, where um, 
someone you know is in the future and uh, someone just jumps out of bed and they go on the conveyor belt and their clothes get stripped off and washed and fed and you know we want to see well could we really build something like that you know that you would sleep in and it would give you a good sleep and then in the morning it's going to force you to get up it's going to strip your clothes off shower you we look, we looked into automated feeding and then it's going to give you your clothes get dressed and you know you're going to get out there one one thing that we actually did have a lot of discussion about the get up and go um, behind the scenes and we're trying to figure out how to do it is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning you take a piss right everyone everyone knows that so how are you going to do that in the pod and we we're talking about like a, a you know having like a urinal pop up and like you know but of course discovery decided yeah. that yeah you know, on tv people don't go to the bathroom right and also you could tell that nerds built this because only one person sleeps in it at a time <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, so this was actually, th we had a real hard deadline for this one, and this was scary because we were de debuting this in Union Square in San Francisco, which is a, a pretty serious, you know, kind of touristy spot. So we had this whole thing kind of pushing it like a, like a uh, tele-commercial or whatever, like, you know, buy this now as, you know, yeah, TV. Like, yeah, like those Pitchman things. Yeah. You know, Terry put on his white coat and was trying to sell it to, to the crowd yeah. in Union Square. It, it was pretty bad. Um, so the system, the, the hardest part of this was fitting everything inside. There was an HVAC system, and uh, let's see, what else do I have on here? We have uh, a machine that Zaz had that would control all of the pneumatics. Uh, again, we had a basic stamp to control. Um, we had like some optical encoders, and we had some lights, and LCD, and a, and a user interface, and just a, a lot of crap in there that we had to fit in that was never actually shown, right? So it just looked really cool, but there was all the stuff inside. Yeah, it t turns out, especially the HVAC system, you know, we, we, we got this super cool little compact one. I don't know if it was supposed to be for like an RV or something like that, but uh, we had to put that in there, plumb all the air around. Ch uh, the water supply was off board, so we, we managed to uh, sort of cheat a little bit for TV for that. Yeah. Um, let's see, other, oh yeah, so the, so, so the basic stamp, we had an optical encoder to detect, to control the, uh, to, to know where the, this shower tray was. Um, another export to communicate with Zaz's stuff. So what, at this point, we sort of had a system where you know, all the control stuff would just be sent over to Zaz, either serial or network, and then he could do all of the heavy lifting for the, for the stuff. So it sort of worked out that way. Here's, here's the user interface. Yeah, so I, had, um, I got, got lucky. Uh, I had a friend who was working for Color Kinetics, and I said, uh, you know, can you, can you send me some, some Color Kinetics lights sort of under the table? And uh, so he, he sent me a bunch of these iColor coves. And at the time, I don't know if the situation has changed, but at the time, Color Kinetics was just being really bitchy about releasing the protocol for talking to any of these things, and people were having to like, spend a lot of time reverse engineering it. So I just said, look, man, can you, can you just tell, tell me what the protocol is? I promise not to tell anyone. And um, so he hooked me up and gave me the uh, Ethernet protocol for the Color Kinetics lights, which is really nice. Yeah, it was like Ethernet to, to DMX512, I think, which was the standard. That lighting. was one of them, but yeah, yeah there was those two protocols. Um, so and then the whole thing was actually controlled, you know, just by a Mac Mini, um, the, uh, by the, uh, the GUI on the side there. So it wasn't all automated. There was like a, just a nice little control thing that someone could use. So when we actually demoed it, Joe was off to the side VNCing into that Mac and then controlling the GUI using that. So it was to total Wizard of Oz man behind the yeah. curtain. All right, so here's what happens. Here's a demo. So that's our producer giving it a test ride as the thing closed. So we don't have a full demo of Zaz getting showered and stripped and everything, but I know you guys want to see yeah, that. If, if but you're that, really into that, you can download the show. Yeah. All right, so the final um, build that we're going to talk about is the automated pizza delivery because everybody loves pizza and every, you know, no one wants to actually go out and get it. It's a pain in the ass, so you know, why not bring it to you? So the backstory behind this one is that the network exec in charge of Prototype This had gone to like a Brookstone or something. Or, no, no, he'd seen the SkyMall catalog and he'd seen one of those little silver helium remote control blimps in the SkyMall catalog. And he said, you've got to have the guys use that to deliver pizza. You know, that's going to be totally awesome. Put a pizza on that blimp and deliver it. And we said, that's a stupid idea. That little blimp cannot carry a pizza. And he's like, no, 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 no. You've got to put the pizza on. You've got to put the pizza on. It can do it. I'm sure of it. We're like, no, it can't. He's like, how do you know? Have you weighed the pizza? <laughs> so. Finally, we're like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to figure out a way to do pizza delivery automated. But he just insisted on the blimp. So, you know, he forced us to get in one of those big blimps that they have at um, the uh, uh, stadiums, you know, giving, throwing out T-shirts and stuff like that. And we had that carrier pizza. And then we went to the Goodyear blimp, and we threw pizza out of the windows of the Goodyear blimp. And 
you know, just basically to be like, leave us alone. We're going to do this, but not with a goddamn blimp. Yeah. And because of this whole weighing the pizza thing, like every, every day, Tessier would get an email. Have you weighed the pizza yet? <laughs> so just, just to kind of like, you know, stick, stick, stick the knife in a little bit, we filmed this sequence of weighing the pizza. Yeah, and, and, um, and yeah, th- working on this show is like working at any other corporation. You have a bunch of dumbasses up here with stupid ideas trying to tell you what to do. <laughs> and... and be- and being hackers, that really sucked. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's, here's weighing the pizza. Yeah, this is weighing the pizza, and, and uh, yeah. Whenever you do a prototype with a blimp and a pizza, sooner or later, you gotta weigh the pizza. I got my scale, and I got a pizza. Ah, fresh out of the oven. Commence weighing the pizza. 3.51 pounds. Gentlemen, I've weighed the pizza. Three and a half pounds. So that's a, a, to- a total prototype, this in-joke, and now you get it too. And the guy approved it on the network. I don't even think he knew we were making fun of him. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two different versions. We had the, um, a robotic version for city streets and then an, uh, um, a vehicle for longer distances. And, uh, you know, this would have been cool to use, like, a DIY drone sort of thing, quadcopter, but there wasn't, you know, accessibility to that yet. Um, so the automated, uh, we had a pizza pie pack. So for both of these systems, we needed a way to autonomously give you the pizza once it got there, right? So we had a credit card-based system, this crazy wired up just by hand basic stamp. We had an LCD, mag stripe reader, keypad to enter in all your infos, um, and motor controllers and optical detectors for the, for the pizza tray. Uh, and it was, it was cool. Here's sort of like, you know, we have to build a prototype before we build the real thing. So there's Zaz demonstrating the pizza pie pack. And then that's, the, uh, that's one of the final versions, the robot version. Yeah, so that robot on the, on the right um, is uh, my, I, again, you know, we, we hit up our contact network. And I didn't have to go very far for this one because my brother uh, started a company uh, called Marathon Robotics. Uh, they're doing really, really great. And they make uh, live fire sniper target robots that are completely autonomous. Um, they're, they're, I think, the... Uh, this is what he's told me anyway, uh, because the U.S. Marines bought some, and they're, so they're officially the first um, autonomous ground vehicles to be deployed with the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, so here it is. Yeah, here's if a video of shot. This is, this is my brother making fun of me, <laughs> because if you look closely, he's wearing my signature T-shirt on that robot that just got shot in the head. So I don't know what he's trying to say there. <laughs> um, and uh, the robot, you know... When, after they get shot, the other ones all scatter and hide because they know that the first one got shot. So they're super, these super cool targets. So we called him up and said, you know, how do you feel about getting a, like a vacation that won't be relaxing or fun uh, out to the United States and uh, bring, the, bring a robot and demonstrate it on the TV show? And he said, yeah, okay, we can figure that out. So the first thing he had to work out was how do you bring like a 300-pound heavily armored mill droid to the United States at short notice? And the answer is, you take all the armor plate off and check it as luggage, and then you carry all the sensors on board. And when, any, when anyone from the TSA asks, you don't say that it's for a heavily armored kill droid or mill droid. <laughs> so, yeah, the whole, the whole, they brought the whole thing on with them uh, on the plane. Um, and what was I going to say about this guy? Um, the LiDAR. Yeah, so um, it's based on a Segway RMP platform. So uh, this was a thing that Segway put out specifically for um, researchers and you know, robot people to build robots out of. Uh, the, it, it has GPS, but they weren't really using it because they couldn't get into the GPS. Um, they, like they, uh, there aren't, they, or at the time, weren't models on, out there that were completely open and would give them access to everything they needed for generating their noise models. So the, really the only sensor that's being used is this ZIC LiDAR that gives you a range, a single line of range, and it comes out of the front of the robot. It's also the only vulnerable spot on the robot. Um, and it's like a little tiny slit, and the marine snipers have tried to shoot it. And well, last time I went to visit him, there was a bullet wound right on the edge of that lip. And the, the marine sniper was like, all right, if, you know, if, that's, if I can get that close to it and not break it, then you know, you're probably okay. But you know the guys are going to tr- have a shot at trying to shoot that sensor out. Um, but what it meant is that uh, when it sees a hill, if the hill is too, sleep, uh, too steep, it uh, interprets that as a, uh, an obstacle because it's only got that line of laser range finding, which led to some uh, pretty significant challenges delivering pizza in the streets of San Francisco. Yeah, but it worked out great. It actually worked in the city, and, and we were happy to get pizza delivered to us. Um, so then, uh, uh, real quickly, we had the, the autonomous vehicle as well. And this was um, a project that was run by a friend of ours, Anthony Lewandowski, 
who it turns out was working at Google on another project. And, um, uh, but he was you know, just doing this on the side, so he came over and used his car and helped, you know, drove, drove over the Bay Bridge. It was actually the first, um, what, rolling roadblock, the first bridge closing of an autonomous vehicle or first bridge crossing. It was totally cool. And it turns out that the guys from Google um, uh, had seen this on TV and said, Anthony, we want you to do this for Google and paid him a lot of money and now he's doing the self-driving car for Google and he's probably the one that benefited the most from doing this show. <laughs> Re really quick story about the rolling roadblock. You can see there, you know, the police, they, they can't close the Bay Bridge, you know, for just about anything, right? Because it's like such an important artery in San Francisco. So um, they say, we'll do this rolling roadblock. We'll basically just hold traffic back while you do this autonomous car crossing. And um, at the time, the car did not know anything about traffic lights and the cop uh, goes up to the producer, John Tessier, uh, and said, you know, there's, there's, there's traffic lights in between where you're starting on, at the marina and the bridge. What are you guys going to do about the traffic lights? And Tessier just said, we're just going to blast right through them. <laughs> and, you know, because he didn't know, like, you know, dealing with the cops, you never really know. And the cop was just like, I thought as much. All right, let's do it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> It, big it was props awesome. to the SFPD for that. Yeah, it was, it was a, a really cool experience. So, um, yeah, that's, that, that's basically it. That, that was our experience on Prototype This. One more in-joke that was too oh, nerdy yeah. to make it to air. You can see here we've got our, you know, playing with the pizzas. And every time we would take a pizza out of the pizza pie pack or any of our testing of, like, delivering the pizza and so on, you know, uh, Joe is an athlete. He gets hungry a lot. He would always take a slice of pizza out and eat it. And... Um, uh, so we had this running joke that we wanted to get into the show about how pizza transmission is a lossy process and there's like parody <laughs> errors, yeah. you know, and every time you get it at the other end, there's a slice missing, but it was too nerdy and they didn't make it to air, but yeah. now you guys know it. Yeah. And we ate a lot of pizza, man. I don't know how many pizzas we ate, but I think after this episode, I didn't touch a pizza for like a few months. Yeah, it was, oh, who thought you could get sick of pizza? Um, anyway, yeah, that's it. We are going to... Um, QA room number yeah. one, if you want to ask us questions. And the goons have kindly uh, asked us to say that if you could leave through the side doors and not the back entry door, that would be much appreciated. The ones that say exit. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>